Hello and welcome to another episode of Dear Future CRO. I am joined by my esteemed co-host, Esther Iyamu, CEO and founder of GrowthQ. Hi, Esther. Hey, hey. Esther and I are absolutely thrilled to be joined by Dr. Molly Malouf today. Dr. Molly is a, a prestigious author, physician, Stanford lecturer. I mean, the list goes on. And I think who better to, to introduce yourself than obviously Dr. Molly herself. Hello, Dr. Molly. Hi, nice to meet you. Lovely to meet you. Thank you so much for joining us. So I know you wanted me to introduce myself and give you my background. And I will start with the reality is that I got really lucky in life. I was born into an incredible family and I and I and at the same time, due to a variety of really challenging experiences as a child, um, determined that I was gonna be a doctor at a very young age. And in some ways I always knew that I was not gonna be a normal doctor because I had so many different interests. Um, and I ended up getting to become a physician, but through the process of many rounds of uh, success and burnout, got to, you know, got to medical school and halfway through medical school, I was really struggling with my performance and with my mood and my focus and attention. And I was at a psychologist's office asking him, you know, what's wrong with me? What do I need to do? And he's like, you're not depressed. You're not anxious. You don't have a, you don't have like a diagnosis. He's like, you're just a stressed out medical student who's not taking care of herself. And that really gave me a ton of autonomy over my life and enabled me to make a lot of changes in my life because I needed to stop drinking cups of espresso. I needed to stop skipping meals. I needed to stop pulling all-nighters. I needed to spend more time with my family and my friends. I needed to meditate. I needed to exercise more. And I wasn't doing the basic things that you need to be healthy because I was doing everything I thought I needed to do to, to get the grades. And I was actually really suffering. And so by making all those changes, my grades dramatically improved. My test scores went up. My performance skyrocketed. I started having more capacity to do more at the same time. So I started studying for my second board exam. I was able to overcome test anxiety that I'd had lifelong. And I also um, started doing you know, research with a sleep doctor. And so I was really just kind of like hockey sticking my, my performance and my peers were kind of flabbergasted when I got my second board exam score back and it was a 99th percentile. And my first board exam was like an average. And so everyone was like, did you cheat? And I'm like, no, I just changed a lot of things about my life in like nine months. And so from there, I got really obsessed with education and teaching because my, my peers were like, well, teach us how to do this. And so I designed a course. Um, it was my first course that I designed. It was in medical school and it actually got added to the curriculum. It was called Physician Heal Thyself Evidence-Based Lifestyle. And I, I recruited all these doctors to teach it with me. And it was, you know, a really, it was really important thing because there wasn't any wellness ed education at the largest medical student, um, medical school in the country at the time, University of Illinois, which I think is still probably the largest medical school because there's four campuses. And then I got to my residency and my residency was really challenging. And I was like, obviously people know medicine is hard, but what people don't tell you about medicine is that it's basically a military bureaucracy and it's run kind of like, um, it's it's re it's basically run like mili very militaristic, and so it's not super heartfelt or warm. It's very much cutthroat, and if you're not like everyone else, if you're a square peg in a round hole, you're not going to fit in the modern medicine. Like it's designed for people who do well in institutions, and I was never going to be that girl, and that's just I was always a rebel. Like I was always challenging status quo. I was always pushing the boundaries of what I thought was you know, what I thought was, was good for the world. And I was always questioning the way things were done. And I was, um, I'd always had a dream of working, um, after reading cancer ward in sixth grade, like many years later, I'm on a cancer ward and I'm taking care of children with cancer and they're getting fed like cake and candy for treats and stuff. And I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm not the only person here who took biochemistry and physiology. Like we know that cancer feeds on glucose. Like, why are we feeding kids this garbage? We know it's making their cancer worse and nobody believed me and nobody listened to me and they all thought I was crazy. And now fast forward, everyone knows that sugar is not good for health. Everybody knows that you shouldn't be eating like processed foods. And 
at the time, it seemed like um, pretty groundbreaking to even be talking about nutrition as medicine. Um, so now, you know, fast forward, I've worked in, um, so long story short, I left my residency. I got my medical license anyway. I, I completed everything I needed to get my medical license. And then I started my own medical practice and I started working with startups in Silicon Valley. And I worked with over 50 companies in 10 years. Um, I ended up starting my own medical practice, working with executives, investors, and entrepreneurs, started working with billionaires and high net worth individuals, ended up getting asked to teach at Stanford, which was pretty wild. Taught there for three years from my Stanford course, I decided to write a book, um, that's based off my course, my work in with, with clients and my work with startups. Um, and then I just got really, really interested in human connection as medicine and moved to Austin in particular because of the level of community here and the health of the community is, is just a really different place to live in comparison to a lot of other places in the country. And, um, and yeah, now I'm like working on my own company, Adama Bioscience, and we're pioneering, um, psychedelic assisted trauma informed sex therapy, as well as a brand around human sexuality and educating the masses about how to take better care of their, their, their selves and how to love better. So powerful. So powerful. Goodness gracious. And just to hear that you experienced what you experienced that then pushed you to have the courage to go on it on your own. Um, just, I, I can't wait to see the impact you'll have on so many. Um, specifically for you know, hearing your story for sales professionals, I know there are so many out there listening that experience burnout. The statistics are what they are. Sales professionals are the second highest role in demand right now in the world. Um, turnover rates for sales professionals are at a record high at 39%. And you're seeing burnout rates even higher for sales professionals because there are shifts in dollars for companies to grow in uncertain times. And so what happens when that happens? The focus turns to let's get more, more quota carrying talent to push and grow the number and sell, sell, sell. And so I'd love to get your perspective around those who are listening or in those roles right now. How can they, um, how did you turn around burnout for yourself in more detail and instruction that they can take away? I mean, the one thing I will say is, um, you know, first and foremost, if you don't have a strong purpose, sense of purpose for what you're doing, it's going to wear you down emotionally to be doing work that doesn't feel aligned with your values. So that's probably one of the biggest pieces of advice I can give people is like, you really need to work at companies where you feel deeply mission driven and aligned because it's going to help you stay focused and stay um, in a place of more positive alignment with, with like the people you work with. One of the things that I see a lot of is when people are working in companies where they don't really believe in the mission fully and they're not really totally engaged in, and, and they're almost like pushing so hard to build something they don't really care about. And we're in a world that is rapidly changing and there are obviously lots of opportunities for sales professionals to find jobs. But I think one of the biggest things people forget about is they're so focused on money and they're not focused on mission. And so they're like working for a dollar and they're just not like there's a disconnect between why they're going to work and what they're doing. And like it can be really wearing on you emotionally. And I see this in doctors. I see this in people who work in a perf I mean, I was having a conversation with a woman yesterday and she's like, all my peers are so focused on just running, like just running things the way that they've always been done. And she's like, I really care about prevention and I really want that to be part of my life, but I don't know how to do that in a system that doesn't care about prevention. And so I'm like, well, look, you don't have to work in the system. You can totally be an independent doctor. It's still scary, but it's totally doable. Um, so I do think that you have to ask yourself like, okay, like where am I working? What am I doing? Who am I working with? Do I feel good about the people that I spend time with? More often than not, people don't realize the effect of emotional con contagion. So if you work in a psychologically unsafe environment, you're not going to thrive because you need psychological safety to feel like you can do your best work. And if you feel like there's animosity at work, I mean, I see this in all my executives. If they, if they are getting along with their coworkers, then everything is great for their health. And if they are not getting along with their coworkers or their family, then things do not work out well. So the one thing that I think is overlooked the most when it comes to health is the role of relationships and the role of connection. 
And I think one of the bigger things that, that fixed my burnout was literally just reconnecting with people that I loved and trusted and felt and felt safe with and not isolating myself. And a lot of people work from home. So if you have an opportunity to spend more time in an office, at least part-time, don't underestimate the power of human connection and the importance of getting that face time with your peers so that you feel bonded to them, because that's going to make a big difference in your ability to actually show up and do the work that you would need to do. Now, that, now, on top of all that stuff, the thing is, is that if you are fully burned out, the reality is, is you need, you need to recover. And recovery comes in a lot of different forms. First is like, you can't do a ton of high intensity interval training. You can't do a lot of intense exercise. You have to do more gentle exercise like yoga, you know, mild Pilates, lots of walks. You have to move your body, but you can't overdo it. And a lot of people, you know, when you, when you hear about biohacking and you hear about optimizing health, everyone's like, you know, and I write about this in my book a lot, like exercise is life. But if you are burned out, you have to take really good care of yourself and be able to recover from exercise and recover from, from all of the work that you're doing during the day. And you have to sleep. So sleep is like non-negotiable. You cannot work late into the night. You have to go to bed early or whatever time is best for your chronotype. And you really need to turn off those, t t turn off the television, turn off the phone, turn off the screens and get that rest because that is where you recover the most. You need, you often need a vacation. A lot of people don't take vacations. And, um, I have like an entire living room of recovery tools. So massage, Theragun, Biomat, acupressure mats, uh, PEMF mats, saunas, like, like there's a sauna blanket. I'm getting a sauna, like doing all the things you need to recover, um, is really, 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 really key. And then sometimes you have to pull in supplements. Like if you're feeling like high stress, but not burned out, adaptogens are great. But if you're feeling completely burned out, you might want to see a functional medicine doctor and get your hormones checked and see if you're, you're, you know, oftentimes what you see is your cortisol levels will be very low. And oftentimes even your sex hormones can drop too. And so you may need support for hormonal help. And that that's something that you need a functional doctor to help you with. When you talked to Dr. Molly earlier about um, the psychological safety being an, a, an imperative component to well-being, both professionally and personal, can I ask you, where do you think that in, in the kind of grand scheme of things, the tech and, and sales space specifically, where do you think companies rank psychological safety in terms of what's important? I really don't know if enough companies care, but my sister, Corinne, is a VP at a tech company. And like she used to be a scrum master before she became a like a executive. And I think one of the reasons why she was able to move up so if, if, what seemed very easily <laughs> was she's incredibly emotionally intelligent and she has this ability to resolve conflicts really beautifully and help people smooth things over in teams. And it, I think it's made her an incredible leader. And I mean, I look up to her and she's my younger sister. And, um, and so I think like, I think a lot of people don't necessarily prioritize working on emotional intelligence, especially if you're just trying to scrape by and get paid and like you're trying to meet yeah. quotas. But oftentimes what will make you a really good salesperson is being really emotionally adept and really listening to the person you're selling to and really hearing their pain points and really empathizing with them and being able to offer them a solution that can help them solve their problems. And so I think it's probably like one of the better things that you could do to train your workforce is an emotional intelligence because it's only going to make better salespeople and it's only going to make better coworkers, you know? Um, it, and like, you know, it's taken me many years to develop the ability to have proper conflict resolution. A lot of people don't really understand that a lot of the same stuff that you can learn about through books on relationships completely apply to coworker relationships or friendships. So I've been studying the science of love for two years and I've been really trying to understand like there's like love, the hand wavy, ooh, Disney story. And then there's like the love that's actually a driving force of creation and also what binds us together in communities and families and in relationships. And so I look at love very differently than most people. It's literally a force that creates proximity to create, to share information and resources to enhance the survival of the species through proximity, creating um, tighter bonds between groups, but also increasing the chances of reproduction. So it's like, I see, I see love as a very scientific thing and that's not to diminish it, but when you have groups of people 
that truly have each other's backs and truly care about one another and create the conditions where going to work makes them feel safe and protected and cared for, you're going to have better performance. Like it's just, it's just going to lead to a, an environment where there's less emotional resources that have to be directed to feeling like you're afraid or you have to deal with someone who's difficult versus actually directing those energetic resources to solving problems and selling products. So I think that it's really important for anybody out there who's in an executive role to really think about bringing in experts in emotional intelligence and conflict resolution to people, because it's just so, it's so simple. It's literally like empathizing, validating, and mirroring people. And then also recognizing that within, within every conflict, there's two sides and almost everybody has a role in a conflict, even if even if there's like someone who may be more responsible than others, taking responsibility for your actions and in, in any conflict is really the secret to moving through it. Um, so, you know, it's funny because I have friends that are salespeople and they tell me about their jobs and, and they tell me about conflicts that have come up. And I, and I see that it's, you know, there's a lot of young people that are working in sales roles and they don't have necessarily the training to deal with complex work environments. They're just figuring it out. And so they can be a little bit more emotionally volatile or sensitive and, um, mentorship cannot be overlooked as well in a business play. And, and especially because like, I think there's a, there's gotta be a reason for a lot of turnover in salespeople. Like if they feel like they're just, you know, a work for hire kind of job, then what's their incentive of staying, you know, like what's, if they're, if they're not having a good experience, why would they stay? So I think it, I think for re employee retention, the more that people can feel nurtured and cared for and, and like invested in the more that they're going to be more likely to stick around. And that's really about company culture and having worked with 50 different companies in 10 years, I can tell you that the companies with the best culture are the companies that have the best retention. And they, it's just, it's just so fundamental. Like if you create a culture where people feel loved and cared for and safe, they're going to stick around. Cause it's going to be because the, cause the workforce, the work environment is going to add more value to them than just the money. And oftentimes people will, will stay, even if they can get paid more somewhere else, they'll stay in an environment that offers them more emotional benefits. And so it's just so funny how it's overlooked so much. I, I so empathize with everything you've mentioned. I mean, it's the reason why growth Q, the, the company that I'd started even exists. Um, I, I experienced burnout at work um, for several reasons. I had some some unfortunate health things that happens, but at the same time, like you mentioned, didn't feel connected to uh, the work. Passionate, I didn't feel my purpose was connected to the work. And um, I didn't feel that psychological safety of that connection. Now, some in some places, yes, I did. Uh, don't get me wrong, I was there 16 years. But um, uh, it, but in in the most routine um, parts of my work did not. And and there are many that feel that same way. I'd, I'd love to get your perspective on the science. I mean, in your book, The Spark Factor, you talk about the fact that, you know, connecting and making human connection, there's science behind why that's so important. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it's so cool. I mean, literally we have neurobiology designed for us to connect and also defend ourselves and aggress against people that are, um, that are, you know, antagonistic. So we have the vasopressin system and we have the oxytocin system and oxytocin is the hormone of safety, trust, and love. And vasopressin is the hormone of defense and aggression and protection. So men are a little bit more vasopressin dominant. Women are more oxytocin dominant, but we have both in each of us. So, um, Anyway, long story short, when you feel like someone is trustworthy and has your back and makes you feel safe and you expect going into an environment to like be, be good for you, good for you and make you feel good. Um, and when you go to work and you like around people that make you feel like happy, that oxytocin is not only creating deeper bonds, but it's also anti-inflammatory, antioxidant protective to the heart and protective to the mitochondria. So it literally is a healing tool. Like love actually is healing and it's also linked to longevity. And so it's not surprising that if you have a culture of, of people that feel trust and safety, then it might increase the longevity of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a company or a culture. 
Now, the other thing that I want to talk about is how health is really the ability to adapt and self-manage in the face of adversity. So health is product of our energy capacity. It's a product of literally our cellular energy. And, and if we have enough capacity to meet our demands or more capacity than our demands, we feel well-being. But when our capacity is less than our demands, we feel really terrible. Honestly, we feel like we're overwhelmed. We feel like we're overextended. We feel like we don't have enough to meet our demands. And that's when our bodies start to feel like there's not enough resources to help us thrive and flourish. And so this is kind of the way it feels like if you have enough money in the bank to buy your groceries versus if you don't, right? So the same thing is on an energetic level. So when you build energy into your body, like today I went to the gym and I lifted weights and I had a really good protein shake when I got home and I walked there and back and I meditated a little bit in bed this morning. And I just like had this like really lovely morning. I saw some people that I care about at my gym said, hi, I have a really wonderful gym where there's like a lot of friends that go there. And, um, and so I got human connection. I got nourishing food. I got, um, I, I got a little bit of exercise from walking. I got more exercise from lifting exercise sends the signal to the cell to make more energy. So I sent the signal to my cells and my brain to create more BDNF, to make more neural connections. I got that sense of safety from human interaction. I got outside into nature just on my walk. I got fresh air and oxygen, which, which oxygenates the cells, which helps improve energy capacity. Um, I got meditation in to calm my nervous system, help me handle my stress. And so what I'm doing is I'm basically modulating that energy capacity and trying to lower my stress levels to create the conditions where I have an amazing work day. And that is that in like, you know, I obviously took my supplements and, and drink water. And so I'm doing all these habits that are designed to actually get my body into a state where I can feel really good when I go to work in the morning. And, um, I'm fortunate that I make my own schedule. So these days I'm starting work around nine or 10 and I have a whole morning routine that I'm doing and I'm ending work, you know, probably around eight, sometimes nine, but it's a lot. I mean, I work a lot, but I also, feel really good, you know, and that's what you want when you go to work is you want to feel good about your day. Now I have a lot of friends that are younger and have made some of the same, same mistakes that I've made, which is they're not doing the things that they need to do to optimize their health. They're not exercising. They're not eating properly, skipping meals. They're drinking coffee. They're not meditating. They're not sleeping enough. And they're on Adderall and they're on vape pens because they're using these crutches to get them the dopamine and the and the things that they need, the stress hormones they need to get their body to move. That will lead to burnout, I guarantee it. And it's not healthy to depend on, I mean, yeah, some people need stimulants to manage ADHD. I completely get it. I was on it during medical school. But I realized that the reason why I turned to ADHD medicine was because I wasn't doing all the things that I needed to do to manage ADHD. And a lot of people just like can't do the things that they need to do because they don't have the discipline to create the habits. But it takes many, many years of developing these individual habits before they become routines, before they become not even conscious. You just do them in the morning, you know, and that's health 101. You know, you got to send the signal to make more energy. You have to charge the cells with proper nutrition. You have to oxygenate the cells because you need oxygen to burn the, the fuel to create energy. You need water because your body is 70% water and you need human connection because it lowers your stress levels. And nature is also great for lowering stress. Um, so, you know, I write about this all in the book and I really break it down into the, into like separate sections around um, mitochondrial health as an overview, which is the energy capacity making the, basically the power plants and the batteries and capacitors of the cells. So we want to get into physics. Um, and then there's, metabolism, which is all about blood sugar. And I'll obviously really trying to feed yourself properly and understanding how to personalize your nutrition. And then movement is, is life period. <laughs> movement is life. If you don't move your body, you're going to be stagnant. You're not going to have vitality running through your cells and then mastering stress. Really, really key. I could write, I'm going to have to write an entire book on burnout because my book is really not a burnout book. It's really a metabolism book, but I've gotten so much, I've had to talk about burnout so much on the book tour that I'm like, oh man, I got to write a book on burnout next. Um, and then from there, there's also um, 
connection. And I talk about love and sexuality and, um, and relationships. So, so many interesting um, thought provoking points raised there. I'm really keen to understand your perspective more on, um, so you talked earlier about good health is a reflection in some ways about adaptability and agility. So now let's, you know, look at things and, and the current climate and the landscape that we live in with COVID, with working from home, with the, you know, economic crisis, so many factors for change. How has that impacted society's health as an overview? Well, first and foremost, it pains me to see the consequences of social isolation on human health because we have an epidemic of diseases of despair, of addiction, of suicide, of mental illness, of homicide. And it is 100% a product of the way that we are designing society to disconnect and isolate people from their tribes. And you see this in relationships. People are not willing to work, put in the work to heal relationship wounds. They don't have the training. They don't have the templates. Oftentimes their parents were the example that they got and their parents did not give a good example of how to actually um, be kind and loving to one another. There's a decline in religion. Although there's still a lot of spirituality, there's a lot of people who just do not have proper moral um education so people are kind of um it's it's in a lot of ways we're devolving socially and it's a big travesty because we really do need love and connection to thrive and i i think that it was 100 percent the secret of my success during the pandemic was the fact that i had an incredibly tight-knit family and community that supported me when i needed help and were so incredibly generous with their with their um like I was a nomad during the pandemic. So I got to stay with a lot of family and friends for like two and a half years. And it was just like really profound how many people were so nurturing towards me. And I realized like not a lot of people have that. And that's really not healthy to not have human connection and have a tribe. Um, I've always been extremely social and I've always valued community. And I've always spent a lot of time on my relationships. Um, but I really doubled down on them during the pandemic because I knew, I mean, I was studying, studying love and connection. So I was like, it's gotta be something to this. And I just got really interested in this space because I was like, I, I, I tend to have like intuition that puts me fortunately a few years ahead of the curve in terms of health trends. And so I really believe that the big health trend coming is human connection and social connection and the disconnection that has come from the pandemic has created a lot of problems, I think, for work and for and for relationships. And I think we are going to have to create a new normal of what does it look like to have a hybrid work model? What does it look like to be at your job half the time and at your job with your family the other half of the time? How, how do we raise children to be more connected to their parents and to feel like their parents are there for them more? How do we create the conditions where um, where people have communities that really care about them. I mean, living in Austin has been a really beautiful experience because I have like a college campus as a neighborhood, like my, all my neighbors, I know like a bunch of my neighbors, I can like walk to their houses and it's just a different world than in, I lived in San Francisco where I didn't really know my neighbors very well. You know, um, in Oakland, I definitely knew my neighbors more than I did in SF, but I just, I really think that we need to, we need a social connection movement and we should have it government sponsored and it should be through every single public health department in the country. And it should be through every employee wellness company and every employee wellness department. And it should be like a, a group effort to get people reconnected because it's only going to enhance human health and mental health and human flourishing. Oh my gosh. I can... I will send my $20 in the mail because that was absolutely the perfect commercial for what we do at Growth Q, right? Our whole focus is around human connection. We are a match. Yeah, we're a matching platform for the listeners of this call, sales professionals in particular, to connect to mentors and to the jobs, full time or part time, that help find them purpose, right? Um, and help connect them to their purpose. So, 
I, I love that you shared the importance and the movement around human connection that's coming and that's in front of us um, because it's very real and there's science behind um, uh, the need for that, especially coming out of the isolation we've had for the last two years in the pandemic. So, so, so appreciate you sharing um, that that specific uh, piece there. Um, can you, you talked a little bit about, um, you talked a lot about sleep. You talked a lot about human connection. You talked a lot about movement. I'd love to get your perspective around nutrition, specifically for that, you know, busy on the go person that, um, you know, needs to move, but also um, a lot of their work means they need to think. And so uh, brain health is critically important for what they do every day, not their physical strength, but brain health and EQ. And so can you talk about the right nutrition to really support and help your brain? Yeah. Um, so your brain is probably the most energy demanding organ of the body. So it's really important to fuel your body for proper brain function. But a lot of people are riding the glycemic roller coaster. So if you put a blood sugar monitor on, you can literally see how your body responds to different foods. And if there was like just an article in the wall street journal recently about how sandwiches are really not the ideal lunch. If you eat a giant sandwich with two big giant pieces of bread or a giant burrito that's like got, got a huge tortilla, you're getting a massive glycemic load of refined carbohydrates. And that will lead to blood sugar spikes. And that will make you tired because you will get a big insulin spike. And that insulin spike will cause your blood sugar to drop. And your blood sugar will often go low, be lower, like it'll overshoot, especially if you have a big glycemic load. And then you're tired and then you're hungry again. And now you're snacking and now you're on this up and down and up and down and up and down all day long. And your body is not in a state of health. It's in a state of metabolic stress. So I recommend people check out, you know, wearable technology like blood sugar monitors or just buy an over the counter blood sugar monitor and test your blood sugar after meals one to two hours after a meal. And you can really see like how your body responded to that food and getting my blood sugar stabilized through lifestyle has been one of the most important, most enlightening facets of my journey as a doctor in the last 10 years. Like I was not funnily enough. Okay. When I first started my career and like become a licensed physician, I was on the outside, very healthy. I was lean. I looked fit. I was on the inside, very unhealthy, but I had committed to a life of building health and working with other people to create health. And in 10 years, I've built a lot of health into my body, but it took a lot of practice and effort and changes. I did not know in 2014 that I was borderline pre-diabetic and I thought I was this healthy person and I had, didn't really fully realize that going off of stimulants could actually change my insulin sensitivity. And it changed my diet. I gained some weight. I got some insulin resistance and it was a journey back to health that really got me obsessed with metabolism because I was just like, I want to understand how to measure this and I want to understand how to change this. And so I spent like a lot of the last 10 years studying metabolism. And then there was a point of time where I was like, okay, so my brain needs help. Like I, I do think I have, I do think I'm a neuroatypical person, whether I am on some form of spectrum of ADHD or Asperger's or some form of spectrum, the reality is, is that I'm not a normal brain. And so I did have to start using nootropics when I got off of Adderall to support my neurochemistry in order to function normally because I was really struggling not taking stimulants. It was a hard, hard thing to do going, going off of them, but they were affecting my heart and I didn't feel like my heart felt normal. And so I knew that it, my, I had an intuition that these were not healthy for my heart and I needed to go off of them. So I, took, I went off of them. And so I started experimenting with nootropics and supplements. And the first things that really worked for me were, were like methylated B12 and methylated folate. Those were really getting like on a methylated B, B complex was really important. Um, getting my vitamin D levels up was really important. Taking magnesium at night really helped me relax me. Um, and then I started tinkering with these questionnaires that you can take. One's called the Braverman assessment. One, there's another book called the mood cure. 
And I created my own questionnaire called the mood, ba mood brain questionnaire. And it's really a derivative of both of these, these questionnaires, but it helps you triangulate which neurochemistry system, whether it's acetylcholine or dopamine or norepinephrine or endorphins or GABA or serotonin that need support. And then there's different supplements you can take to experiment with different systems. So I was experimenting with things like Huprazine A for memory. I was experimenting with things like CD choline. I was experimenting with things like, um, you know, uh, Sarah, uh, let's see, Sam E was something really helpful for me. Um, and through tinkering with my neuro neurochemistry, I was able to find a supplement stack that really helped me. And now there's companies like BioOptimizers that makes this really crazy platform called Nootopia. And there's getting there's there's so many things that are getting smarter. And like there's another company my friend started uh, called Thesis, and they're re, they're like a, a replacement for for like stimulants and Adderall. And so there's some really 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 impressive like supplement companies that are coming out that are actually comparable in efficacy to to pharmaceuticals. Um, and I just think it's really like people are. I had to just figure this out on my own. But I've always known that there were going to be products and services that would systematize a lot of the things that I knew how to do. And then my job would be to educate people on where to go and find the best, you know, products and services. So, I mean, that's that like I, I would say that if you really are struggling with brain function, supplements can make a difference. And a lot of people give me crap for recommending so many supplements because they're just like you know, they think you're, they have a sell. A lot of people give me shit for selling, but I think it's important as a doctor to recommend products and services that you really love and, and that you actually know the founders and you know that they've done their homework and you know that they live the example and that the products that they're selling are real. Like if you go to my website, I've got an online store and I know every single one of these people who I am recommending their products and I've talked to them and I've, inv I've done my diligence on these companies. So I, I'm trying to build a personal brand that is a reflection of a, of a doctor who's, I'm not, I'm, yeah, I have affiliate deals with these people, but I'm not getting paid that much to make these recommendations. Like the affiliate deals are sweet, but they're not like, it's not like I'm like raking it in or anything. Like, so, so it's, it's funny because it's like, people are like, oh, you're always selling something. And I'm like, no. I just really want to support the people and the products and services that actually um, are a reflection of the things that I care about in the world and that, that are helpful to people. Amen. Amen. I'm very excited to read your book. I know Esther is too. Um, and I think that there's already lots of material ready for the next one as well. So yeah, it's <laughs> something. And it's so funny. People are like, you talk to psychics. And like, sometimes people recommend me to see, to talk to people. I was talking to this guy and I'm like, am I going to write? Like, tell me this is like the last book I have to write. And he's like, oh, he's like, come on, you're going to write a bunch of books. And I was like, it's so hard writing books, guys. Like, let me tell you, like, it was way more work than I anticipated, but it was also deeply rewarding and satisfying and getting to speak to so many people on podcasts has just brought me so much joy. And like, I did it as a labor of love and I, I'll just write more books as a labor of love because it's just. And when you write that one on burnout, we've got to get that in front of as many sales professionals who need your content as possible. Tell people to go to my blog and I've got two really good articles that summarize stress and HPA access dysfunction. And we should put that in the show notes um, along with some of my favorite stress tools so that your people out there can get some tips. Cause I have a lot of information in those two blog posts. So I'll make sure to record those. Oh, you um, for the, you know, future chief revenue officer or future sales executive out there that is going to do it differently than what they've seen in the past, what would be your advice for them, Molly? So we ask this question, dear future CRO, we ask you to finish that sentence. Dear future CRO, you may be an entry level salesperson right now, but if you believe in yourself and you put in the work and the persistence and you genuinely work as hard as you can at your role, you can become anything you want. And the entire reality of your existence begins first inside your mind. You have way more control over your reality than you realize. So write the story of your life on paper and then watch it start to unfold. I love that, I love that. And oh, by the way, make sure that working hard is just as healthy as it is hard. <laughs> I love it. 
work smarter, not harder, Amen. honestly. Because like the more the more you build health into your body, mm-hmm. and the more that you actually like really do work very hard on your health, the more capacity you have to actually um, perform your job. And so you oftentimes can get more work done in less time. Amen. Well, we so appreciate you taking this time with us, Dr. Molly. I am sure we're going to be seeing you again. Um, Thank you so, so much for, for all the great advice you shared with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you also to our viewers who have tuned in today. A huge, huge thank you again to Dr. Molly for joining us. Uh, On behalf of Esther and I, we're so pleased that you tuned in and we look forward to seeing you next time. In the meantime, please show some love on the socials, share, like and subscribe. And we look forward to seeing you next time on Dear Future CRO.